and welcome back to Scarred for Life, the podcast where we open up old wounds by looking back at the films that scared us as kids. I'm Terry. And I'm Mary Beth. And each episode, our special guest brings with them a movie that traumatized them as a child. This week, our guest is Kevin Kopaka. He is a painter and a director, and his latest film, Dawn Breaks Behind the Eyes, was a huge hit at Panic Fest and is now being released on VOD on the 24th of June. Kevin, hello. We are so excited that you are here with us all the way from Berlin today. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very excited as well. Yeah, we're so excited. I, that your, your movie, we'll get to it in a minute, but your movie was a, a genuine surprise for me at, at the fest. And I just, I love it when a movie can just be one thing and then turn into something completely different. So, but before we do talk about that, let's take it back to the very, very beginning. How did you get introduced to horror? Um, I don't, for me, it kind of feels like I was like literally born with my love for horror because when I was um, three years old, we, my family and I, we went on vacation and there was this toy sh- toy store and they had this little like really gross looking skeleton with glowing red eyes and I kind of became obsessed with that. So I kind of bugged my parents until they bought it for me. And ever since then, I've kind of been like really, really obsessed with all things horror and uh, so, for instance, when I was four or five, I started, um, you know, in quote, 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 unquote, writing my first mm. story, which was basically I was just dictating it to my dad and he was writing it Aww. and I was illustrating pages for it. There was like 50 pages and it, it was called The Murderer. So it was <laughs> kind of about a little boy who who chases, I don't know, he wakes up one night and he sees that like there, there's been a knife in his, in his door, someone with a knife kind of cut through it and he kind of goes investigating and he finds this murderer and he, he he goes chase him through a, like a castle and through the woods and eventually there's kind of like a, a showdown and he kills the murderer and yeah oh wow so it was a kind of mess, messed up story for a four, I was year, say, old, four so. year old four that's that's amazing <laughs> yeah. i love that <laughs> I love that your dad was writing it for, like, was was writing it as you dictated it. And he was like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Continue. That's amazing. It's okay. And then the murderer slices open. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of, yeah. In, in retrospect, I'm really happy that my parents, you know, didn't freak out uh, because they kind of indulged me in my my horror fables. So they always kept buying me a new, new horror stuff. And, I, yeah, I got really into because I was too young to watch horror movies um, for a long time. So I, I was mainly like reading a lot of horror comics yeah. or like uh, horror books. I had like these anthology short stories that I kind of used to read. And and I, I, even before I watched my first horror movie, I, I already kind of knew about all the, you know, the classic franchise horror characters and the alien and predator and stuff like that. So, so I've been, yeah, a horror film. I was a horror film for like eight years before I even watched my first horror movie. Oh, not, not eight years, but yeah. So did you, did you grow up in Berlin or where did you, where did you end up growing up at? Um, I'm um, from Austria, Austria. so okay. uh, uh, yeah, originally grew up in, in Graz, yeah, and my mom's from Sri Lanka, but they kind of met in a- Asia, and they, my dad was a hippie, and <laughs> yeah, they got married three, three weeks after they met, and they moved uh, to, to Austria, and yeah. What was, the, what was the horror scene like there? Like, did, were, did you have access to a lot of horror movies and horror stuff, or was it, was it harder to get things? Because I know some places in Europe, especially, I, I don't know when you grew up, but it was a little bit more of a censorship type thing. So I was kind of curious how, that, how you got introduced to it. I mean, in, in Austria itself, it, I think there was not really that boom, okay. for, for, also for, for kids, for like horror stuff. And, but luckily, I kind of had the opportunity. We got like British tv mm. because my uncle was living in the uk so he gave so we got like fox kids and nickelodeon and you know there was luckily in the ni- early 90s there were a lot of really cool horror shows there was like tales from the crypt keeper yeah. which was the cartoon version of tales from the crypt that i really liked and yeah of course are you afraid of the dark mm-hmm. goosebumps uh, so i had a lot of goosebumps books uh, growing up and yeah so everything i i could uh, like scary stories to read in the dark oh, like all yeah. the things for kids Hell, who were into horror yeah. I was, I was into, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd so, love but, yeah, but I was kind of the only one uh, because in Germany or in Austria, nobody knew of all this stuff. I just got it because when my dad went to the States, he brought me some stuff. And yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was kind of a bit of an outsider. Yeah. <laughs> so then what was the first horror movie you watched after you've like been reading all this stuff? What was the first movie you watched? Uh, the first horror movie I watched was called uh, Sometimes They Come Back. Oh. I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. know it. It's this, like a Stephen King Stephen adaptation King. Mm-hmm. about also like a group of, of bullies from the 50s that come back to haunt this one guy. And I can't really remember much. I just know this one scene where they're hiding in the church in these ghosts they're not able to to go into the church so they're kind of waiting outside for them i think it's it's kind of a fam- family friendly horror film so it was a good 
good for good the time to watch it. Yeah. But then, so what were some of um, your favorite horror movies when you started watching them? So what were some of the movies that you mm-hmm. saw that you really loved as a kid? Or I guess, how old were you when you first, when you saw that first movie, I guess is the first question. Probably like nine years okay. old, okay. I think. Okay. And yeah, I think my first introduction to the horror, to horror movies in general, um, I don't know if you guys remember in the, in the early days of the internet, there was a site called houseofhorrors.com. Uh, and it basically, it had like a list of a very sel- select few movies. I think it was like 10 or 12 movies where it had like um, photos and sound bites. And, and it, luckily these were like the, the small selection of films they had were films that I still love a lot. It was kind of like Evil Dead, Reanimator. Oh, mm-hmm. Uh, Cemetery Man, uh, Zombie as well, and Dawn of the Dead. So all of these classic uh, non-franchise horror movies that I got really into. And so I kind of started saving up my pocket money. And every month I, I was I went to the store and I was able to buy one movie. And so I kind of went through the list and I got like Return of the Living Dead. Oh, wow. A lot of zombie movies, actually. Uh, yeah, one of them was, of course, Fuji Zombie as well. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I got into it. And uh, I think uh, there were some some like non horror movies that I watched before, that like Terminator Two, that kind of freaked me out as well. But mm-hmm. <laughs> when it first came out, but yeah, and there was like a big problem, unfortunately, in Germany or in, in Austria, that a lot of the movies were cut. Yeah, because they were quite quite strict. So it was always kind of a gambit to go into the store, and you know, I paid to pay like a lot of money for it for a vhs or dvd and then to find out that it was a cut version it was quite frustrating yeah i can i can imagine that because uh, that was i mean that was a huge thing um i mean it still is to some degree uh but like it was huge back in the in the late 80s early 90s there was a lot of things that were unfortunately cut i remember uh everyone freaking out about you know friday the 13th one of one of those i can't remember which numbered one but they had just like hacked all of the the gore out of it and it's 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 frustrating for fans, especially if you are a gore hound. <laughs> yeah, and if you saved up all your pocket yeah. money, and then you're like, oh. Shit. <laughs> and you watch it, and it's like, oh, there's nothing in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know you said you you know started writing around you know f- four years old about horror stuff, and you you started watching horror movies. Were you a scared kid? Did did horror movies and horror stuff scare you growing up? Um, I think up to a certain age, um, yes, but. Um, I kind of I've been suffering from sleep paralysis oh. my my whole life, so I don't know if you you guys know about it. Um, yeah, where you, yeah you kind of hallucinate and you see like really freaky stuff happening, and and because I had that since since an early age, I kind of had to train my body not to be frightened oh, of these okay. things. Oh. So as a result of that, I kind of unfortunately I I don't really get scared as much anymore. Uh. And yeah, so it's it's kind of a shame because I, I kind of wish I w- were able to still get frightened as much. But yeah, because with the sleep paralysis, I saw some really yeah messed up stuff, and I had to kind of train myself to just just you know look at it and think, okay, it's not real. I had always heard of sleep paralysis, but I'd never had it before until about six months. This last six months, I've had it twice, and boy, okay, wow. <laughs> there's no horror movie as terrifying as 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 being stuck and unable to move while you see things that should not be in your room. That is, so I, I can <laughs> I can actually empathize recently because it's a, it it kind of fucked me up. I've yeah. never experienced it and I don't want to ever. Yeah. <laughs> but so you okay? So you say that you you really don't get scared because of that, which makes sense. Is there a movie that you've seen recently that you think? kind of almost scared you or kind of scratch that itch of mm-hmm. getting under your skin oh yeah um i think one movie the, like um caveat um, oh have you seen that one <gasps> yes mm-hmm. like that there's, there's oh, this one one scene yes. of, yeah <laughs> in the cellar <laughs> yeah when there's like the hole suddenly the hole in the yes! uh, over, over the corpse and the, so that that was really quite freaky i was like okay wow and this this is quite intense so this really got me yeah this is definitely one and the other one it's like the um, the sadness i i you had also you had rob as a guest i saw and this one it freaked me out in a different sense it was just very visceral and yeah it uh, just kind of upsetting it was very <laughs> Im- upsetting it's, it's good the good word and i think it was the uh, because i watched watched i saw it at fright fest when it um, which was like pretty much a year ago mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i just watched it again now that it came out on shudder and even though i had seen it before i still felt very uneasy watching it again and, and this rarely happened to me so i was like okay this is quite uh, effective that, that's a good one yeah that that movie like was 
I, I've seen it like two or three times now, and it, it's like every time I'm watching it, I just two get that three, pit in my stomach. What is wrong with us? <laughs> <laughs> we got to introduce your friends to it, you know. I know. It's like, <laughs> like you want to see something really fucked up? Let's watch this movie. <laughs> because also with the sadness, I I was really upset about the just the implications because yes. I was thinking, okay, if this happens in real life, then okay, I would need to go back to Austria to protect my mom. And then it was like, okay, what, but what if I, you know, I come to my mom and then I'm infected, then it's even worse. You know, if I do something to her, so it's like, okay, shit, what, what should I do? Or just like the thought of all the, you know, children and their parents suddenly get infected, like all the stuff you luckily don't see in the movie, but just the, the implications of it mm-hmm. really stuck, stuck with me for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, yeah. Uh, so what draws you to the genre now as an adult? Um, I don't. It's hard, it's hard to say because, yeah, as I said, I used to be so um, obsessed with horror, and then as I grew a bit older, I kind of tried to, I don't know, shy away from it. Okay. You know, I moved to Berlin, and I, I studied fine arts, and in the back of my head, I always had this thing. You know, I, I used to love horror, but yeah, now I've, you know, it's it's not um, artistic. Or I don't know whatever. And at some point, I was like, you know what? Uh, you know, it's it's just the thing that still gives me the most pleasure in in life in, in general, just the horror genre. So I was like, okay, I, I kind of got out of this this brainwashing. You get from studying art i guess where you say like okay this is art and this is not art and stuff like that and i just kind of fully embraced it again like 10 years ago i guess and i've just and i don't i think um what one thing i always really like is just um, i'm always drawn to to atmosphere to things that kind of uh, elicit a certain atmosphere and i think the horror genre has maybe the sci-fi genre as well but the horror genre just has uh, like the most the, the most interesting atmosphere in in films because it's just very different different directions and it's yeah uh, i just like this feeling of dread and uh, and doom but also something sometimes you know beauty and uh, like all these different atmospheres that that can be evoked in in the horror genre just the idea that you know that you have just this very simple premise mm-hmm. of a horror film it's something that elicits fear out of you and there's just so many different ways you can do it and it's just so many different i don't know it's it's just a very broad genre and has like from from splatter to to i don't know art house to creature features you just have like all these different sub genres and yeah it's just a very very versatile genre speaking of sub genres what um what do you find yourself like gravitating towards now as an adult in terms of like do you like splatter movies do you like creature features do you like more psychological what kind of pulls you in i generally feel like my definition of horror is like the horror films I like are usually they are like supernatural okay. in, in a sense, like not ghostly, but just like demons and um, and monsters and stuff that I kind of prefer those over just classical, you know, um, realistic horror films that are kind of where there's like a killer or like a thriller, thriller thing. Mm-hmm. I still I really like demon movies in general, um, like just like Night of the Demons and Demons yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And too many, too many new ones, unfortunately. And and generally, I I love gore, so I love also of course I I love like splatter and visceral horror films. But um, I'm kind of mixed on the you know these new um, these slow burn um, uh, trauma related horror films. Uh, there's uh, some I, I really like, and but some that that I just kind of I think they're good movies, but I personally don't wouldn't say I like them because they're yeah maybe not for me as much. But then there's some others that I just really enjoy. Yeah. I think Sorry. trauma movies are kind of becoming almost a trope. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of them, but, like, there's so many of them now that they keep turning out. And they, I don't think they're saying, yeah, I don't think they're saying anything new. <laughs> it's, it's oversaturated now. And, like, as, yeah. a, as a girl who loves to watch movies about trauma, like you said, Same. it's like, okay, like... Ugh, oh, it's it's terrible because like I'm so glad that people can use like hopefully they're pro- like here's the other thing too like are you using it to process trauma or are you using it to like capitalize off of the fact that people want to watch movies about trauma which always is a slippery mm-hmm. slope for me too but again like that's a hard question to be like so are you a traumatized person or not <laughs> like right anyway right. but so Kevin like what would you say some of your favorite movies that you've seen in the past like five years have been or like a couple of your favorites <clears throat> I have to open my list because I have a letterboxed list I can't keep track of too many but oh yeah The, the Innocence I really oh, liked oh The Innocence was so good I really liked that mm-hmm. movie I was surprised it's, really it's cool. so dark yeah, it was it was quite yeah it was quite intense. Uh, also, I like the the ending. It's kind of yeah, it's it's kind of it. It goes it's with a, a whimper, not a bang. It's just like really slow ending. I have to check. I, I think most of them you've probably all seen. There's like not a lot of hidden gems, but uh, uh, we're all going to the World's Fair. Oh, and I really liked a lot. Even though when I was watching it, I didn't like it as much, but I just kind of kept thinking about it. And yeah, in retrospect, I really liked it a lot. Um, Hellbender, I liked a lot. Titan uh, was great. Of course. 
than um, Two Witches. Have you seen that one? I don't think so. Two, two Witches. Witches. I think no. it's Two Witches. It's um, it was shown at the Salem Horror Fest, and I kind of was writing with Pierre, with the director, and so we kind of sent each other the screeners. And I think it's coming out now uh, via Arrow. Oh, oh. It, yeah, it, it's it's a really cool film. It's I think it's it's a good mixture of. And it's actually a very scary horror film, but it's in some way I think it's also quite funny because it's I, I think it's it's of course intentionally funny, but it's it's a great mixture that it's it's very scary and fun at the same time. I've somehow missed this one. <laughs> it, it didn't have a, a long festival run. It was at Sitges, but okay. um, and at Salem, and I'm not sure which a few others. Oh, I saw his short short film I Who Have No One. I've seen that short mm-hmm. film, but I didn't see Two Witches. Oh. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to keep this on my radar. Yes, me too. That poster is incredible. Uh huh. And um, then uh, my heart can't beat unless you tell it to. I, I liked. That's such a sad movie. Yeah, I'm just going through. Uh, the Empty Man was pretty interesting. Uh, Hist- History of the Occult. Have you seen that one? It's like um, a South American horror movie. No. History. I, I think it was, but uh, I'm not sure where. Like Christian Ponte is the director, and it has like a really high rating, so I was kind of interested to check it out. And then I, I was in touch with the director, and we also kind of exchanged uh, screeners. And this one is quite interesting because it's I don't know, it reminded me a bit of of maybe Pontypool uh, in a sense. Okay, what's it called? Um, his history of the occult. Oh. This looks really good. Okay, I'm, I have movies to add to my list now. I'm like yay. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I was uh, kind of lucky like last year because of um, I was myself touring at festivals, so I got a, a, I was really um, I had a lot of films on my radar to that came out the last two years. So um, okay, so speaking of being on the festival for your movie, can you tell our listeners a little bit about uh, your new film and what it's about? It's a um, I don't know, you could say it's it's a gothic horror movie set in the seventies that tells the story of a relationship in a. A multi-layered kind of uh, like a multi-layered way, <laughs> if that makes sense. I know it's as you guys you've seen it. It's kind of hard to to kind of explain it, but yeah, it basically it's it's just a big love letter to the the Euro horror films of the sixties and seventies, and especially Gothic horror films. I just have to tell you before we talk about it. Terry told me to watch this movie. I came home from a concert. I had I was not <laughs> maybe totally sober. And I was so excited to watch it at like one in the morning. And I was like live texting Terry my reactions as the movie progressed of me just like my face slowly like getting bigger and bigger and excited with like all the different <laughs> things that happen in this movie. It's just, oh, what a, what a good time. What a good, what a good movie. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> but yeah, as you said, it's, it is really difficult to talk about because the, the film does sort of like fold in, folds in on itself, tells a different story, kind of changes direction a bit in some places. What were some of your inspirations though for, for, uh, for making this film, the setting and the way it was filmed? Like I, it feels like, as you said, it's pulling from a lot of Euro horrors. Were, were there any thing, were there any movies in particular that was um, informing this one? I think, yeah, the initial, um, inspiration was um, the iron rose from jean Rollin. okay i don't know if, you, if you've seen it it's 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 about the couple who are kind of trapped in a graveyard uh, the whole night and it's it's also it's not really a supernatural film it's very atmospheric but it's kind of about the constantly shifting dynamic between this couple and so this was kind of the initial idea i just wanted to do a film about a couple who spend eternity in a castle and just to kind of see how their relationship changes and if they're kind of stuck with each other for eternity and out of that, it kind of this whole story kind of blossomed and it became something really different in, in the process. And so this was one movie. Then, of course, um, to think, yeah, the, the Whip and the Body from, from Mario Bava, mm-hmm. which which I quite liked as, as well. And um, uh, Daughters of Darkness, yeah. of course, this one I quite liked. Then some, you know, some Fassbinder movies, some German German movies, because it's just because I was thinking, OK, it's, it's if I'm making a film in German, it's, it's always... You know, I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with making German films or German films in, in general. So I was thinking, okay, if I do it in German, it has to at least also be inspired by the German films from the time. And uh, and I, I quite have, I've, I've never been into Fassbinder as much, but then I kind of started watching a lot for for this film. And, and I thought they were actually quite funny because I always thought they would be just these very depressing, you know, kitchen sink dramas. But uh, they, they had some really strange and absurd surreal moments in them, which I quite liked. And so this was an inspiration. And of course, like um, from uh, Laras, the vampires, uh, 
this one I like. I know it's just like, like a, a whole bunch. And um, but also from the second part, there's actually some some you wouldn't might not guess. Like I was really inspired by hair, by the musical hair okay. from from yep. Milos Forman. Okay, I can see that. It's just <laughs> I can actually see Just that. Just this kind of over the yeah. top, uh, you know, over the top hippie, hippie thing, and Psych Out, uh, which also, yeah, like a hippie movie from back then. And yeah, I think um, society. Um, okay, of course, yeah. was yeah. <laughs> because like we're not going to get into spoilers, but there is a sequence in here that is it's not it's not the shunting that happens in society, but there it like it brought to mind shall I say, that movie. And I immediately wrote my note, is this society happening on my, on my screen right now? So I, I, I was, I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love society. And I, I was actually surprised that people kind of caught the reference because initially I wanted to do it with a lot more special effects. And I had kind of uh, contacted the special effects guy and he was like, okay, for 10,000 euros, we can do it. And I was like, okay, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. I won't be able to afford it, but somehow we still managed to at least. Oh, get it's very evocative to, of that it, movie. It, it, like very much is. <laughs> instantly in my head that cool. that's, that that's kind of what you're going for. And I think that's what I love about, th about this film is when, when you first start watching it, you think it's one thing and I'm, I'm, it's kind of this, this, uh, I'm going to say almost a slow burn between these two people exploring this house and then it turns into something more and there's moments of graphic violence and then it turns into something else. And then I'm just like, I, I love what a movie can do that. And I, I'm also like what I, what I actually really loved about it was that there are these moments that reminded me, okay, this feels like um, kind of like an Italian Italian shot film with like some of the color patterns and the way the camera moves. And this feels very society, but it doesn't feel like, um, I don't know. It feels like it's doing something It's elevating it. It's more, it's, it's taking that and not just recreating it, but doing something different with it. And that is what really, I think impressed me about your film. Oh, thank you. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also very interesting to just to see the, the reactions people, people give because it's, it's of course very uh, mixed. You know, some people, they just like really, really hate, hate, the, hate the movie, well. especially because they they really like the first half and then mm. they just hated it, that it kind of goes into something different. And other people are like, OK, they didn't like the first half, but then as soon as it kind of changes, they liked it a lot. So, of course, you can't always please everyone. But yeah, but yeah, I'm really happy that, that you enjoyed it because uh, that's kind of my intention was it's it's a film that's very aware that it's being watched mm -hmm. by an audience. So it kind of plays with the expectations a lot. And I think usually when you watch a film after a Sort of a certain point you kind of you kind of can grasp in which i don't know in which range this film is you know is it violent is it uh, you know is it this and that and if you kind of take that away from the audience then i think then you kind of have to be aware that anything can happen and that might evoke a sort of sort of fear as well even though i don't think it's a scary movie but yeah well just uh, disorienting i also love the idea of like voyeurism in it because you have like you have the the ghosts the two ghosts that have been living in this in this castle right and then you also have like the the two uh the two main leads that come to the castle because it, she's inherited it and so you have like them watching them but then there's also something else that's being watched at the time and it sort of is all about that kind of voyeuristic focus of these different characters through different lenses and i just i don't know i just love it when when movies do that get a little meta in that in that regard but not necessarily like calling out that it's meta just sort of like playing with that that it's just another level that you can appreciate in a film and i loved it <laughs> oh cool <laughs> how did you find the house the castle yeah castle i've actually i've known about this from for many years because of my f uh, former flatmate she was I'm, I, i'm not sure if i'm supposed to say what the castle was used to what it oh. was supposed to be used for because it was used for like fetish parties and oh. <laughs> so that's how i kind of find out, yeah. found out about it <laughs> Uh, which it's it's not used for now. Now it's it's mainly for you know weddings and you know, special events where you can rent it. But yeah, that's I how I initially found rent. out about it. Rent your castle for the next. <laughs> rent the castle for your next shunting. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So we just kind of went went to visit um, the castle because I just really wanted to do um, a film where it's set in one location, just that you don't always have to travel to different places. And and so yeah, actually the the castle I saw the castle and I already had some of the concept for the script in mind. But 
once I was there, it was okay. I, I kind of knew the the basic structure of the of the place, so I could kind of write the script around it. And like all the animals, they're actually living in the castle or near the castle. So this was quite amazing. Wow! Like the peacocks and the white rabbits and pigs and what and like all cats and the, they're all kind of they were already there, so we didn't have to bring them. Wow. Sounds like they're the rabbit, like down the rabbit hole, like a magical, weird <laughs> place in a good way. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <laughs> well, it's almost like a cliche at this point, but the house really is a character in this movie. Like, and that's and that's what I, I I wanted. Like Mary Beth, I wanted to know more about this. I was like, where is this place? This place is it's gorgeous, it's haunting, it's gothic. It's a uh, there's something mm-hmm. kind of sexual about it. So I'm not surprised to hear <laughs> the history, but like that's that's so oh that's so great. But but I'm not sure if uh, after our shoot if they are going to let anyone else shoot in the house because <laughs> they came by at the second day when we shot the. Okay, and now I can't I can't spoil like one scene with a lot of people involved in like a sexual nature, mm. <laughs> very euphemizing. But and then they were quite shocked afterwards, so we had to um, yeah clean everything up after, and we didn't get the stains out and stuff like that. So they they kind of took all the the advance oh, payment no. and they kind of. <laughs> but in the end, I think they were quite happy because we were able to leave the castle in a in a in this in a nice state. Like we didn't burn down the castle or anything. <laughs> Couldn't get the stains out. <laughs> oh man, I cannot wait for people to watch this movie. <laughs> it is so hard to talk about, but you're like, you just guys, just watch it. Just watch, just watch the movie. It's incredible. But Kevin, we've talked hmm. about your horror history, but what movie did you bring with you today for us to discuss? <laughs> um, I brought um, Zombie by Lucio Fulci from, ah. what, 1979, 1979 or 8? Yeah. Yep, yeah. 1979. This, is, this really definitely traumatized me a lot. Ooh, so excited. So before we jump into that, I'll read a quick synopsis and then we will jump into your Scarred for Life story. But Zombie, strangers searching for a young woman's missing father arrive at a tropical island where a doctor desperately seeks the cause and cure for a recent epidemic of the undead. Dun, dun, dun. All right, Kevin, <laughs> why is this your Scarred for Life pick? Tell us your Scarred for Life story with Zombie. How old were you? So think, yeah, Where did you see it? Everything. So this film, it, yeah, it traumatized me even before I saw it. Because as I mentioned this on this House of Horror site, they had they showed this poster from the, for the US release, which you all know with the tagline, we're going to eat you. And you see this, this really, um, yeah, rotting zombie. So this freaked me out just before having seen the movie at all. So I was just like, okay, I, I can't watch this movie. And at some point I still bought it and I watched it by myself. And it was, it was like a, a cut version, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So like some of the scenes, like the eye gouge, gouge scene was a bit cut. Okay. But I, I was just like really totally freaked out by, by the film and especially by, because I, I'd seen, I think, one or two zombie movies before, like Return of the Living Dead I've seen and maybe The Dawn of the Dead, I, I'm not sure. But I, I thought the zombies in this film were just like really different and, you know, they have their eyes closed and um, I don't they just seemed really dead. And it's compared also the makeup is, of course, great. It's not just like blue paint. Uh, or what what some films used back then and i remember like this just, just one moment that kind of stuck with me is when the like after i mean of course there's a lot of iconic moments but this was just like really small subtle moment in when they kind of go to the house of the the wife of the doctor mm. who gets her eye gouged out and they just see her lying there and she's being eaten by zombies and there's like this one moment where the zombie is just kind of taking flesh and he's it's hard to describe but he's taking it close to his mouth but it seems like his mouth and his head they're not the same thing they're not thinking the same way so it doesn't it's not his head going to the flesh but it's like his hand like really slowly going there and then he just acknowledges it and i don't it's kind of hard to describe but for some reason that felt really realistic that they're like really dead and they're not functioning but they still have these these urges these tribal urges to feed and so that yeah messed me up quite a lot I mean, that scene is really, I, it's, it's surprisingly shot and I, I've seen this movie maybe four or five times. And when you get to that scene and you know, they, it, it kind of makes me laugh a little bit in like hindsight because they, they walk around the corner, they're looking around the room. They uh, the first thing that you should, you would think they would see is the body and the corpses <laughs> around it, but no one seems to notice it until when the woman goes, 
and points and the camera focuses first <laughs> on the body. And so it's like, oh, OK, there's a dead body here. Her hand is like draped over the side. It's it's partially eaten, devoured and scory. And they're like, ooh, that's kind of nasty. And then all of a sudden you realize that there's not one, not two, but four zombies that are just gnawing on this body that they apparently didn't see when they first walked in. I just, <laughs> and I mean, that's that's some of the joy, I think, in, it's, in some of the, these early Italian cinema, like horror cinema things is, is that kind of almost silliness to it. Where like they want to like maximize the scare. And so... I, but it, I just I love that that sequence and you, the I know exactly what you're talking about because there there's the zombie and he I think it's like almost a, like it looks like a liver there's like a piece of of meat that he's like and he doesn't quite know what to do with it it seems like or maybe he doesn't the actor doesn't want to <laughs> eat the thing I don't I don't know but, <laughs> yeah, but it, it works it's haunting oh, no it's just, mm-hmm. and it's a shocking moment too because I feel like so this is my first time seeing this movie you broke my horror my horror uh cred here but it's my first time seeing this movie and like I, I i like fulci a lot so i knew it was going to be nasty i knew there was going to be it was going to be gross but that scene is like we don't even get like those scenes list this nasty and like modern zombie stuff i feel like most modern zombie stuff like this is just like a horrible gross kind of not quiet moment but like she's just lying there and you're watching her get eaten. And there's something so fucking sad about that and grotesque. And Fulci just lets you kind of marinate, marinate. I know it's like, but like pun intended, <laughs> marinate and like uh-huh. what, what you're watching. And I think something that happens a lot, I think in contemporary horror is moving so quickly with, even if the zombies are slow, like, Ed- quick edits and like moving through the action really quickly and I think what this movie does so well is like slowing down to really make you look at the horror of what is happening in front of you and like holy shit and like it's like you are with them like we talked about voyeurism in your film Kevin but like you are you are so aware that you are watching somebody's body get eaten by these zombies and it's just like holy oh my god and like it's it's really f- impressive to see how Fulci was capturing this in the like in the late 70s and like now I fully understand why people were like this was a real like people were like pissed off by this movie because in the 70s I like I cannot even like imagine people saying that and being like yay applause <laughs> like abs- <laughs> like oh it's just so impressive was it even impressive yeah, this especially oh sorry yeah, and when, when when you see this scene, you're kind of yeah, as you said, you envision yourself being in this moment, and you would not look at the, this scene that long. You would just like bolt out of the house. But it's, since it's there, it kind of grows this this tension, and then they move back, and there's two other zombies standing there, so it, it becomes really claustrophobic, and yeah, quite intense. Yeah, and that's that's one thing I do like about um, kind of going with what you said, Mary Beth, and and the 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 kind of claustrophobic nature of it. The the movie the movie focuses on these zombies and they're very slow. Like these zombies are very slow. And when they, they're very methodical when they, when they are rising from the, from the graves and everything, it's, it's everything feels almost like if you were to watch this and watch like a, a modern day film, you would think this movie was shot in slow motion because everything is very, they're very methodical in the way they sit up, the way they're lurching down the hallway. And, on part of it it's like okay you could outrun these dudes very easily you think but then you also have moments where as as you said kevin they turn around a corner and there's two zombies there and they're now stuck in this in this very the camera's top down almost and 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 you just it makes them feel like they're just stuck in a in like a little hallway that they're not gonna be able to escape from and i i don't know i i love that the movie can make things that are very slow and very um deliberate in their execution feel kind still kind of dangerous and scary. Well, and there's the moment where um, they get to the hospital towards the end and like the zombies are very slowly ambling behind them. And I was giggling a little bit. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, it's almost kind of funny, but then, but then when they get in there and it's like, yeah, they're slow, but once they get to you, like you're trapped, you, you are trapped. And like that kind of, I feel like, and again, like there has been a bunch of like the contemporaries, like the sadness, like zombies are fat, are really fast now, which I like. But this movie was a good reminder that slow zombies can be just as scary, especially if you're in a confined space, not just like in a hospital, but they're on an island too. So like, even though they're on an island, like there's open space, there's only so far they can go. 
And so that claustrophobia just amped up. And again, like, I want to giggle at the slows, like when they look behind them and they're just like a little in the, in the, in the background kind of ambling. And you're like, oh, they'll be fine. And then <laughs> they are not fine. <laughs> but they're also, but they're sneaky. Like, I feel like these are sneaky zombies. Cause again, this happens a couple of times where it's like, oh, they're fine. And then like four more appear in the back room. Just like, surprise, we're here. <laughs> and it's just like, so like, it's, it's like parts of this, I was like, it's so silly, but it's actually pretty effectively scary for what this is. So, yeah, and they're underwater, they're coming from out the ground, so you can't really, uh, yeah, they're kind of everywhere. Oh, the water. And in New York as well. <laughs> yeah, and in New York as well, all of a sudden up on the, the very, I, I love the last shot. I mean, you know, we're kind of skipping oh. it to the end, but I love the last shot of the movie of them just on top of the bridge, just aimlessly trudging towards New York, but, um, Mm -hmm. Okay, you mentioned the water scene, and uh, this is the one, like, I, I, when you think about zombie, there are iconic scenes that come out that sticks out to mind for, for you. One of them is, of course, Paola getting impaled, which I want to talk about, and then there's the zombie versus shark. And mm -hmm. was, was, that in, was that in the original cut that you saw? Oh, yeah, this was in the original. And the, the eye gotchas was as well, but it was, you didn't see the puncture okay. as well. But um, yeah, the zombie versus, sh versus shark scene is, I think, still one of the most impressive directed scenes um, I've ever seen because it's just so much you have to kind of take into account. And it's uh, before CGI. So uh, you have like a, a real shark that they just kind of fed and sedated. And uh, and I think the shark trainer was ended up becoming the zombie, which is probably the smartest choice. But even I... just then the shark bites off his arm and it's kind of green blood mm -hmm. and then he actually bites the, the shark. So it's just like a lot happening. And I have no idea how long it must have taken or how, how lucky you are to get all these great shots. That was, I mean, holy shit. <laughs> and it's not just any shark. It's a tiger shark. It's and, a tiger mm -hmm. shark. You know, everyone talks about a great white shark. And yeah, a great white shark is a great white shark. But like tiger sharks are are very vicious. And so tiger even though this are the tigers of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so even though the shark is well fed and he's sedated, which boy, I don't think, I don't think that would happen today. I don't think this scene could be filmed today as, as it was. Cause uh, that man, I actually, you know, as I remember watching this, Okay, I remember watching this probably, it was either the late 90s or early 2000s when I first saw it. And I think it was a VHS copy. That's what my memory has, but I can't honestly remember. And I remember seeing this movie. I, okay, I remember seeing this movie in, the, in like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video with the cover. And the cover that you're, you were talking about, Kevin, where it's like they're going to eat you. And it's the, the gnarly zombie, another iconic moment that I want to talk about with the worms coming out of his one eye. And I remember seeing this going this is unlike any zombie movie I've ever seen. Like that zombie is unlike the night of the living dead zombies that I've seen or the return of the living dead or anything that I had seen up until that point, And I had always wanted to see it. I didn't know what it was called. I just remember that, that cover. And then I remember reading, I don't remember if it was in Fangoria or some, some kind of some horror magazine back in like the nineties. And they were talking about um, some zombie movies that no one has seen that are terrifying. And this one was on it. And I remember getting, I'm, that's why I'm pretty sure it was a VHS. It might've been the DVD release in the early two thousands, but I'm pretty sure it was a VHS because I remember it being very grainy and being very, um, a, a really bad copy that I ended up seeing. And it, this movie, when I first saw it made me feel very like skeezed out like it because of the way it was looking the graininess of the footage and you can't quite see what's happening it sort of the the eye piercing scene it made it feel more real because it, you know it kind of covered up that uh some of the the more effects that i think now like uh, the last time i watched this was on a restoration i watched this last night on a 4k restoration you know and everything is pristine and beautiful but i think it kind of takes away some of that I don't know, gritty sleaziness of this film. But I remember watching this movie and getting to the shark scene and being like, oh my God, I cannot believe they're doing this and being like amazed about it. Now watching it, I just feel, I feel so bad for that shark because that shark is being manhandled. His fins are being held. The guy is literally wrestling, wrestling the shark. As an adult, I was like, oh gosh, this makes me feel uncomfortable because I feel bad for that shark. I know I need to I, I needed to do more research because like 
I was like, wait, hold on. They really are wrestling a, a whole ass shark. This isn't a Jaws. This isn't some like animatronic. No, like this is a whole ass shark that is just trying to mind its own business. And this guy is just like, like my favorite is when the naked scuba diver is like, it's coming for me. And the shark is so obviously unbothered. I'm <laughs> just like <laughs> swimming around, just like doing its High thing. As a kite. High as a kite, just like bopping around the, <laughs> yeah. the reef. And she's like, it's going to get me. And it's just like, I don't give a <laughs> shit. It's incredible. But I, as, as much as I'm like, wow, they really just took her top off for it's a 70s movie. Incredibly, like, when she takes off her, her top and she's got sunburnt boobs and like a tiny little loincloth and she puts on the scuba gear. I'm like, honestly, I <laughs> though because she knows how to put on scuba gear underwater photographer she doesn't fuck around good for her (laughs) that sequence though is so like the the score is absolutely incredible like the under and it's so jarring when like she comes up out of the water and it cuts off like there is no like seamless Mm. transition it just cuts off and it's like this underwater creepy weird ethereal feeling and it's just inc- like the score is just for this movie is incredible especially in that moment the underwater sequence going from her running from the shark to the zombie to the zombie fighting the shark it's just an incredible sequence of events that happens and i knew i had seen clips of it before on youtube like i knew about it but never fully appreciated how incredible it was that that happened and was filmed under like the whole thing was filmed underwater and wow chef's kiss one of the best moments in horror i i'm gonna say it here Mm. and now one of the best moments in horror (laughs) movie making i think definitely caused by negligence (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. thank you to the thank you to the 1970s for your gross like (laughs) negligence of (laughs) animal life and not understanding (laughs) that but it gave us this (laughs) It sure did. <laughs> did that scene stick out to you when you watched it as a kid? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, it's it's uh, as you said. I think without uh, like if everyone watches the movie, there's going to be these three iconic scenes, which is this one: the eye gouging and the the zombie coming out the ground and biting the the diver in in the neck. I think mm-hmm. so. These are of course the, the the three things that kind of stuck with me all the time. And I mean, what was interesting though this time when I re I rewatched it as well in the 4K um, restoration, and sometimes I used to rewatch it all the time, but then I would just kind of skip towards the the good parts. Mm, mm-hmm. So this was the first time I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch it for the story now. And uh, but I was actually surprised how how engaged I suddenly was with this. Okay, is this reporter is is he going to get together with the daughter of this the, the girl? And oh, there's like some tension and they're fooling around. So I was this time I was kind of more engaged uh, emotionally, which. I also kind of felt bad for the other couple who kind of, they just take them to the island and they both get, get killed. And I was like, okay, this, he's like such a cool guy, the, the blonde one. And yeah, he, he ends, he dies so qu- shortly before the end. So, so this way I was kind of surprised that I actually quite enjoyed the, the character the dynamics as well. And all the characters are actually not just, you know, just like uh, red shirts. So they actually have personalities. And as you said, with the, the diver, the woman, she was also not like a, typical damsel in distress she was also with like the short curly hair and i don't know she she was more of a kind of a badass as well exactly that's what i loved i'm like you know what you're having her get naked but she seems like a bad bitch so i i'll I'll allow i'll allow it (laughs) what i love about that scene though is when she's getting ready and you know she takes off all of her clothes except for her you know um her loincloth her 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 thong like (laughs) Like she's she's just in that, and everyone like the her her boyfriend is just eating nonchalantly. Everyone else is acting <laughs> as if this is the most normal thing in the world. No one's like paying attention to it. It's just like, yep, yeah, all right, because it keeps cutting to them, and you know he's just sort of like eating his food, and the other ones are just sort of like <laughs> just chilling, waiting around. I'm like, this woman is literally getting topless, and she is barely clothed, putting on this giant ass scuba tank, putting on the appropriate accoutrements, putting on flippers, putting on, you know, her headpiece so that her hair doesn't get in her eyes, putting on her, you know, she's doing all this stuff. And yet 
Although I have to say that the strap of the the scuba tank going between her legs is probably incredibly uncomfortable, I would think. (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking the same, yeah. I was like, okay, I don't know if that's the best place for it, but... That was my favorite editing sequence, and it was just cutting back and forth to them, just, like, nonchalantly watching her and her, like, spitting in her mask and, like, doing, like, scuba divers do that. And I was Uh like, wait, hold on, like, she knows her shit. She's going through it. (laughs) And she doesn't, she doesn't die with her tits out. She <laughs> mm-hmm. good for full That's tea. The scene- I still feel bad for her death because it's so um, like she could have easily escaped, oh, but I, I think she was just I, so in awe of this uh, of zombie coming. But I always I was thinking that too because I was like, so I agree that I I was much I was surprised at how much I was enjoying the characters because the performances are a little silly. Like we won't deny. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the blonde hair boat driver boyfriend who is like a little goofy, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. We love them. What Terry? I okay. I just had this thought when I was watching this movie this time that like he looks like, and this is going to like this is revealing some things, but he looks like uh, the typical porn actor in a nineteen seventies uh, American <laughs> porn. Like <laughs> I had Tell to look more, him up. Terry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, when you are, you know, you are a, a teenager in the 90s and you end up finding some random VHS porn tape and that becomes like the thing that you watch. And I, he looks like a lot of the porn actors from that time period the, to the point that like I actually had to look him up to make sure that he wasn't because he just has he that, <laughs> the hairstyle, the gruffness, the like, he just, he looks I like know. he should be like, this is one scene away from being a porno. Like it feels like, and I think that adds to like the, the sleaziness of this of this movie like in another dimension this could have been a zombie porno the zombie <laughs> pornos exist right like i've never oh, seen sure. one mm-hmm. but they definitely sure they exist do. right they have to oh yeah oh, there's like one called uh, um auto up or up with dead oh, people yep. bruce, bruce, LeBruce. Bruce, LeBruce, bruce bruce oh that's right yeah. okay which is it's kind of a zombie porno i would say yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah, that's but, a fair assessment i mean like a zombie pulls her hair while they're making out. It's not sexual, but you could easily make that sexual in another dimension as the zombie's hand comes out and pulls her hair. And the, I mean, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's also the eye gouging. I don't know if you guys read that as something. It, I think it has like a sexual undertone. It does. Oh, yeah. The, the, it does, yeah, because the, the hand's on her head, pulling her. Like, it. it it's definitely like... Suggesting sexual violence, I would say it mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, I guess let's talk about the let's talk about the uh, let's talk about it now. I guess since we're already kind of there, but again, the editing in this movie, the cutting between like you're just seeing like the the tip of the wood, <laughs> like and then flashing back to her screaming and the tip of the wood and the screaming, like you know what's going to happen, but it's just, ugh, because it's Fulci, it's eye trauma, but you're still like I don't. I'm not ready. I'm never. I'm never ready for eye trauma. I am never ready for eye trauma person. <laughs> and it gets so close to her eye. Like I it am. Really does. I am surprised how close that the tip of that wood comes to her actual real eye. Like, is her head's being like what? It, how, I'm curious how they filmed it because it looks as if he's pulling her, and I'm like the amount of control and patience you have to have so that you are not causing an accident on set. <laughs> with that splinter becoming just like literally if it, it feels like it's literally almost touching her eyeball before they cut there away a couple sequences in this movie where i was like they're really really stretching the what safety means <laughs> for, for <laughs> getting these shots good lord mm. but then also we we mentioned this with um the the short-haired woman getting killed in the cemetery and how people don't move, like, there's no resistance, like, in this movie whatsoever when people are getting attacked, like, when she's getting her eye pulled towards. I mean, again, I don't know zombie strength. Perhaps they're much stronger than I perhaps know. <laughs> but there wasn't a lot of resistance. And I know it's a movie, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it was very funny, like, very slowly being pulled towards the 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 splinter. And I'm like... Could you have? Could she have escaped? Like logic, like logistically, could she have escaped that? It wouldn't be fun for the movie, but still. <laughs> I wish she could have just put her hand in front of the splinter. Probably, I'm not sure That's if she had fun. a hand free or not. But yeah. <laughs> but I also love the, love the idea of these zombies having like those intentions of impaling her. Like 
the thought of a zombie having like enough like um agency there's the word mm. agency to like not just like bite her but pull her towards the splinter and is that is that really like looked at again in the movie i feel like that is like what do I can remember like the only part that looks like it, they mur- it murdered her with that specific intention without did that happen again in the fi- in the movie I don't think so okay mm-hmm. I, I don't remember so, no. I was like wait is this a smart zombie <laughs> it, it kind of reminded me have you guys seen um, burial burial ground um which is kind of a zombie knockoff, you could say. And, and, and I think that is, I'm not sure if there's also an eye gouge scene or just something similar. I remember there's one scene where the zombies, they kind of take a, like weapons and they cut off the head, um, like a, what do you call it? I'm, I'm blanking on the English term, the, what the Grim Reaper has. Oh, the um, scythe? A, scythe? Oh, the scythe. a sickle? Oh, yeah. yeah. A sickle, yeah. That the zombies use that to cut off the head. So that's kind of a, a similar. Um, I've, similar idea just to kill them to eat them yeah yeah i've seen burial ground a couple times and the only thing i honestly remember in that movie is uh pietro oh uh, gosh i cannot pronounce his last name bar 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 zo uh, peter bark you yeah, mean peter or? bark yeah <laughs> as the kid in that and the the sort of psychosexual relationship between him and his mom that was that is a wild movie <laughs> that is a wild movie yeah. um okay so the the zombie with the wormy eye was that that was on the the poster. That was your first intro- introduction to this movie. When you saw, when mm-hmm. you finally were able to see it as as a kid, did that did that hold up to you? Did that move, did that scene scare you? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is quite quite freaky because it's also it's it's quite short and because you don't see. That's what I like about the the film. They stay on the zombies quite long, but it still never feels long enough because I just want to. Especially now, I just want to. You know, keep gazing at them because I think they look very, you know, beautiful in a sense, just from the like the makeup and how it's done. It's just like wow, I just want to keep watching those zombies. And I think it's it's an appropriate amount of length that you see it, and it's it's yeah, it comes up, it's it attacks, it's visceral. It looks even creepier with all the blood at the mouth, and it has these weird teeth, like these really sharp teeth as well. And I found so no i thought it was yeah a perfect scene but he, he gets killed off quite quickly but i think there's a few that look i think there were a lot of br- brothers like actual brothers who played the zombies so they kind of look looked alike oh were there oh, oh wow okay that's what, what i read at least uh, yeah because there's a lot that kind of look like this one like bald and with similar makeup yeah so the the makeup but was yeah. done by um gianetto de rosi uh de rosi and they caked it on in several stages. And so the director, Lucio Fulci, kept constantly referring to the extras as walking flower pot, flower pots. <laughs> and it's, it's appropriate because these, these zombies feel of the earth, I guess, in a way like there's, there's one shot and it, it's earlier on and it's a single zombie. And I believe the zombie was walking through shambling through one of the towns and the camera sort of does this pan around him and he looks, I, I think it's a, I think it was a, he, I can't remember, but I, they, they looked very waxy uh, as the camera and it's missing its ear and it's all b- bloody and stuff, but like it looks as if they have just caked on so much shit that it's just it's it's fascinating. Like I, as an adult and watching this now with a fascination for like you know, me- make, uh, makeup special effects, I just kept staring at it. Like like you said, Kevin, I just couldn't stop looking at this how they created the zombie because it's it's Fulci zombies are unlike any other zombie I think from that from that time period, and that's I think what makes them so interesting. Yeah, it's too bad he didn't do. I mean, he did a few zombie films, but none, none that were like. I think this is the only one he considers himself to be like a full zombie film. The others are more like supernatural zombies, I guess. But yeah, I love them all. So, what were you about to say? I'm just trying. To, I'm thinking. I'm trying to like think of of zo- like history of zombies because this was like because obviously we had Night of the Living Dead before this one, mm-hmm. um, and Dawn, and Dawn of the Dead. And zombies kind of before that were usually like reanimated bodies through like black magic or vo- mm-hmm. like, voodoo, you know, pretty race. Like, and this movie carries this kind of racist connotations about voodoo and things like that. Um, and we see that with some of the other char- the characters as well. But it's like you don't see a lot of zombies like this, even in Night of the Living Dead. You obviously you have like you have the zombies the, the Zed are rising, et cetera, et cetera. But they don't look like you said, Terry, of the earth. You don't really see them coming out and covered in this dirt in bugs. Like here, they definitely feel earthy and organic. If that makes any sense. Like 
they're gross and kind of squishy looking and mm-hmm. just decaying. While the zombies you've seen previously either are just like they're not looking like they're decaying. And in Night of the Living, I haven't seen Dawn of the Dead. Don't tell anybody. Yet. But <laughs> like in Night of the Living Dead, they they don't look as much like they're decaying. And here, Fulci really plays up the decay of the body, mm-hmm. especially from because we have like different kinds of not different kinds of zombies, but we have like the bodies coming up out of the graveyard, but then you also have the people in the village who are dying and then coming back. So you have these like different like stages of decay that you don't that I don't remember, I haven't seen in the zombie movies I've seen from that era too, which was really interesting and showing like different kinds of zombies and their different like various stages of being a zombie, which is really cool and gross. Thinking, I mean, now of course the, the Walking Dead, they have perfected the mm. the makeup arts, mm-hmm. but one thing that I always find um, what, what I'm missing with the Walking Dead is it's more not the makeup, but the, the vocals, the, the, because in Fuji zombies, they don't really make any sound. No, but in general, I personally I like the the moaning, the low moaning moaning more than the I don't know what it's now the the yeah like oh the, the rattly got destroyed yeah the rattly thing I, I don't like it as much and um, and also that the in uh, in the Walking Dead they all seem to have long hair and I know that the hair appears to grow after you die but still they they are all like long haired and not not short haired but I think they make some I think there's a few episodes where they make an homage to the the uh, maggot zombie from Fulci as well, where you kind of see that like, some they have like one for Creep Show and one for Dawn of the Dead, so they always have like some Easter egg zombies yeah. in the show, which I quite like. Yeah, me too. But yeah, otherwise you don't really see a lot of these rotting zombies. No, and that I think that's that's what I really appreciated on this rewatch is well a couple things. One is that there are different zombies. You have like the more freshly turned. You have the the conquistadores that are that are there, and I I like that idea that they're on this island that is kind of away a massive graveyard because you know eventually throughout history there's going to be bodies buried all over the place and so mm-hmm. you have they're on a like a walking graveyard and the zombies are coming out of the ground in places that maybe you didn't think there there would be a um bodies buried and they have different levels of decay depending on when they were you know how old the the corpse is and i i love that but i also kevin you mentioned it earlier that one of the things that still i find so incredibly unsettling is that they have their eyes closed like most of i don't i don't believe there's one shot there's one shot that's incredibly eerie where there's a zombie they're in the hospital and there's a cut to a window and there's a zombie up there and he has you can see his eye and it's like i think one of the only times that like a zombie is like directly looking at something and it's it's a freaky shot it like actually really affected me this time i was like ooh, that's kind of that's kind of unnerving but the fact that all these zombies are kind of they they don't seem to really care they just are trudging forward to get their flesh and so their eyes are closed it's almost as if they're kind of they know you're there without having to look and there's something very i don't know unnerving about that and also the gore (laughs) the gore in this movie fulci's blood is just on another level of of thickness of color of everything and i just i love i love seeing his blood it's just so thick and paint like Mm mm-hmm and like whenever you see like a zombie just rip into someone's arm, like I get, I'm, I will always for my entire life be impressed by being able to show a zombie ripping flesh out of someone's arm. I know it's practical effects, but it's just so fucking cool when you can just like have a camera on the flesh and just watch it be ripped off. It's just neat. And just like <laughs> seeing that paint blood just like pouring out, especially when, um, the the diver woman gets her throat like ripped open by the yeah. zo- like the worm zombie and it's just like I can't I can't make the noise because I don't know like the blood blood of like the, she's like, of the blood she's coming gurgling. out of yes oh it's so good and it's so gross and <laughs> it's just paint but it it's beautiful paint just coming out of her jugular from this nasty raggedy teeth that like ripped open her neck. And then there's another, I think it's the doctor when, is it the doctor when the patient sits up at, towards the end, they didn't shoot him, but they didn't, sh- they forgot to shoot him in the head and he rips flesh off of somebody's arm. It actually might have been, I can't remember whose flesh was being ripped by who, but just these incredible <laughs> bites and gore and flesh. And like, but then my favorite is when they just have the flesh in the zombie's mouth and the zombie's just walking around with like a hunk of flesh and they just like <laughs> don't even chew it or anything. It just sits there. It's just, oh, it's so gross, but it's so delightful. <laughs> My yeah. parents are really proud of me. <laughs> 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 uh, 
But did you, for, for you, Terry, also because you had seen it before and you saw it now, did you think it still holds up as well? Or also for you, Mary Beth, if you saw it for the first time, is it? You know, I do, I do think, I think it's a little slow. I think it's a little slow in spots. Um, but I, and I, like I said, I kind of, as much as I appreciate 4K restorations and all of that cleaning up the gunk. I don't know. I, I do feel that watching it because it's the first time I've watched it on the on the, the 4K uh, restoration side. I'd always seen it before on like a, a crappy DVD or like a VHS copy that they didn't spend any time on. I I, I do feel that it kind of loses some of that sleaziness um, because like this this movie when I I just I ha I just have such memories of first seeing it and just being kind of like grossed out about it in the same way that I was grossed out watching like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre on a crappy VHS where it's like it's so dingy and so poor poor quality that it almost feels like you're watching something you're not supposed to whereas here it's like everything is honed to a sheen and so like I think that aspect of it plus I, I do think it is a little slow in spots up into like towards the beginning the it's kind of a little convoluted how they finally get to the island is I think is a little slow and then there's a lot of there's a lot of like dead space I think in the in the middle of the movie but once it gets going I I still think this movie is is, is stellar. I was incredibly impressed. I mean, I definitely think it's slow, but I also think a lot of those like 1978 Italian movies are slow. Mm -hmm. Like, and I kind of know the beats to expect in my, in my brain. Cause we watched, I watched, we watched a lot of Giallo recently. So I know this is not Giallo, mm -hmm. but kind of like that pacing, but Italian I was cinema. so impressed with how gory and how the effect like, that to me, I think stuck out more than anything. Like, in the slow parts, it's like, well, I'm just going to float back and think about the <laughs> naked woman, like the naked scuba diving zombie shark scene. <laughs> like, it's just, there's so many impressive, there's so many impressive set pieces that like, I can't, one, can't fathom being made today due to like legal and logistical <laughs> concerns. But like, two, I mean, like, there's just no one doing it or have done it like Fulci. And it's just you know, incredible to see that proved with every movie I see of his. Because I'm, I, I'm a huge, obviously a huge horror person, but I'm not as well versed in like Fulci stuff and in um, like Italian horror. So just learning more about that and seeing just how influential his works have been and seeing really how he did shape so much of the horror genre is absolutely incredible. And it makes me so happy to see it hold up so well and mm -hmm. have it be still be this like pinnacle of incredible filmmaking. It's just, it warms your heart to be like, you know, like horror is an incredible genre and these things still hold up and they need to be appreciated. Mary Beth McAndrews, who is slowly learning her lesson, <laughs> but it just like an incredible experience. I was texting Terry last night. I was watching it like one in the morning and I was like, this movie fucks. Like this movie is just so good. It is so cool. It is incredible. That's, that's my I answer. <laughs> <laughs> Does it hold up for you? Yeah, that's also big. Um, I, I was actually surprised that it did uh, uh, it held up a lot better than I expected it to, and it was a bit slow. But I had it slower in my memory. I thought it would, was a lot slower, but I think it it works quite well. I mean, you have the opening scene, which is pretty good oh, as well, with mm -hmm. the, the zombie in the boat, uh, and then it's of course a bit bit of dry run where you have like the, the story, but then you get the the shark scene and then the island. So it, it kind of Uh, has has a, a good flow. I, I was just surprised how well rounded the whole thing felt this time when I watched it. Um, so yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, a lot of times um, I, I do think that some of the because I I've kind of gone down a lot of different rabbit holes on it on Italian horror cinema from this time period, and this one actually has a story that I, I think has a beginning, middle, and an end, and um, <laughs> has a more concrete story to it that is easier to like follow and it's not just more of sort of like dream logic or just sort of really cool sequence after really cool sequence this one actually feels like they spent amount of time trying to make a story that makes sense in a way uh and so i appreciate that i also one thing that i i find is is very funny because this movie is called zombie but it's also called zombie 2 it's got like six different mm -hmm. names doesn't it <laughs> and so What happened was, so, you know, Dawn of the Dead, which I know you haven't seen, Mary Beth, Dario Argento recut it and re uh, and gave it a score by Goblin, and they released it in Italy as Zombie. And I have this copy that I haven't watched yet that has Ooh. the Dario Argento nice. cut of the film. 
um, that I, I really want to watch that has the with Goblin and everything. But like, so they released it as a zombie, and because Italian copyright law is so lax, they could make this movie and call it Zombie Two as a sequel. And I'm using that in quotations, so- listeners, as a sequel to Dawn of the uh, Dawn of the Dead, and I. I think that is, I it, it, it just makes me so happy that there are these movies out there that are Italian sequels, because they did this a lot. There's Terminator 2, which is the name for a shocking dark. There's La Casa 3, which is Evil Dead in, in Italy was called La Casa. And so they made La Casa 3, which had nothing to do with, with, with Sam Raimi's movie. Uh, there was a movie called Night Killer that they call Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. <laughs> um <laughs> they made a shark movie and they called it Cruel Jaws or they called it Jaws 5. Like there's all of these and that came out, I think, in 1991. So there's all of these movies that are just sort of like they cash in on the American made American made films as like, a oh, this is a, a sequel to it. And they could get away with it because of copyright laws. And I, I, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. And it's I love a, it's it. It's incredible. I love it. And I think when this was written or shot, um, Dawn of the Dead hadn't even come out yet, or at least when it was written. And then I think the, the New York scene, they, they kind of intentionally shot just to connect it to, to the, the American team. Oh. Yeah, I think they, had to, they retrofitted the this, this script to be somehow tied to, <laughs> to that well, movie. Well, I like the ending. I thought the ending mm-hmm. was, I mean, again, mm-hmm. but I love a good nihilistic zombie movie like, oh, you thought you thought that you survived this isolated incident. The one scene that got deleted that I'm really sad about where you just see the zombies rising out of the water in New York. I heard about that. that they apparently shot, but yeah, that's, I would have loved to see that. I would have too. But it's, yeah. oh, I do think it's... that um, Zack Snyder kind of made an homage to this movie with the end of his remake of um, Dawn of the mm-hmm. Dead because in that movie they get on the boat they're set to sail and it's like okay oh, yeah. they finally escaped and they're going to an island as opposed to leave going to the mainland and then we have here you know them escaping the island and trying to go back to the mainland and then finding out nope you're fucked there's nowhere to go you're just stuck on this boat because United States is now fucked as well so it's like I I, I watching this now after because we had recently watched uh rewatched Dawn of the Dead for our little cut series like I don't know six months ago or whatever and it was the first time I'd watched it in a long time and then watching that and then watching this like oh okay so this this is definitely an homage there we can also b- briefly talk about the the theme the zombie musical the theme the song kind of that's of course the the iconic da, 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 da. Oh. This theme. And I always have to think about it because when I'm home at, at my mom's place, she has a coffee machine. And the when I start it, it gives the exact same dum, 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 oh, dum, man. The exact same tempo. <laughs> Every time it happens, I just kind of sing the theme to myself. And <laughs> my mom's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> I was listening to that theme and like I was watching this with my roommate and she had never seen this movie before and she's like on the side just bobbing her head to some of, to the, some of the music and I was listening to this at, at one point and I was like, you know what? Someone today could take this song and sample it and make a pretty cool like trip hop like, uh, you know, pop song here in the 2000s because it has like that that energy that I, I feel like someone could just sample it perfectly and make like a really cool pop song. Cause it's, it's one step away from being a pop song. in in some cases, mm-hmm. I just, I love that. Do, do, do. Yeah. It's just so good. Like that entire score again, like it's just, like you said, it is like, it feels like contemporary. It doesn't feel like a seventies score. Fabio Frizi, man. I, I love his work. He did Beyond pieces, a lot of Italian films. His music was used in Kill Bill because Quentin Tarantino loves him some Italian cinema. Yeah, I, I think he's a. I think he's a really good composer. I think most most people when they think of Italian horror cinema, they're thinking of Goblin a lot of times, right? But yeah, I do think Fabio is a is a great composer. Fabio Frizzi, mm-hmm. what an incredible name, Fabio Frizzi. <laughs> is there anything else you want to talk about before we? Give us a rating out of five. I just was going to... The one thing that, that really stuck out to me this time is I don't know if they use squibs or what they or if they were shooting people with, like, paint guns. But every time a zombie <laughs> gets hit, I felt that. <laughs> like, I don't know how they filmed it, but there's, like, some scenes where they get hit in the stomach in particular and they just sort of, like, jolt back and then 
start walking forward again. But it it has like a punchiness to it that I'm like, how I'm, I'm really curious if they how they how they filmed it because it feels feels very real that these people are getting hit by something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wouldn't be surprised if they had like paintball gun like, yeah. or some kind of paint gun where they were like, look, y'all, it's going to hurt. You're going to have a bruise, but you'll be fine. <laughs> there's one shot in particular where one gets shot in the head and it looks yes! like they got pinged by a paintball. <laughs> and he just sort of stops. And it's like, I feel like he's registering the pain going out. Oh, don't break character. Like that is <laughs> what it seems like. <laughs> Well, like, especially when they also when they shot the corpses too. I was like, damn, they really look like they shot something. Like, look, like when they the the paint explodes mm-hmm. and all that stuff. I'm like, Fulci was not fucking around here with like the effects, and it's like, nah, like it's fine, guys. It's fine. It's it's 1979. <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> here you have your fi- your twenty dollars for your part. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're going to shoot paintballs at you. Excuse me, what? All right, and shoot. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, Incredible. So, so Kevin, I have to ask, watching this now as an adult, does it still hold the same weight as it did as a kid? Did it bring you back to that childhood memory of being being terrified watching it for the first time? Um, Definitely. I mean, I wasn't terrified watching it now, but I could still... I can still feel see myself being uh, why I can still see why I was terrified watching it, and there was also some shots like especially the one with, that you mentioned with the zombie with the eyes open that I still found really creepy mm-hmm. watching now, because it's from this lower angle. It kind of has like this Evil Dead. He's looking mm-hmm. up the Ooh. basement thing. Um, yeah, I still I still think it's it's a very unsettling uh, film. So I was watching this and I was like, a child watched this. Good God. <laughs> I'm very excited to hear about that because good Lord. Well, you know what? I I was thinking that like, I think, I think in some ways Italian, some of these Italian horror movies are best watched as a kid because they, they do some, I mean, this one a little less than like, say the beyond or, you know, some of Fulci's other, uh, what is it? City of the living dead, I think was another one Mm -hmm. where they have like a dreamlike logic to it, where it's just, it feels, I don't know. It, it feels so otherworldly in a way that I, I do think that there's a good way that the imagery that's on, on stage could easily get into a child's head and be like, oh, yeah, that's terrifying. All right, Terry. Yes. Shall we wrap this up and give us a rating out of five? Sounds good. Terry, how many eye traumas out of five <laughs> do you give Fulci Zombie? Uh, you know, I... I went. I looked at my letterbox when I added this, and I had given it a four. And then I had thought about dropping it to a four and a half. But no, I'm going to stick at four. This is four eye traumas. It's it's gnarly. It's gory. It has some fantastic effects. It has some iconic shots that I just I feel are are so ingrained in a horror fan, whether you've seen it or not. Because I know Mary Beth, you had not seen this movie, and yet. The, the shark scene, I'm sure you've, you've heard about the, the eye impaling. I'm sure you, you've heard about it. It's just, it's one of the, these are, these are moments that I think kind of continue through regardless of whether you've seen the movie or not through, uh, or horror fans like history. It just, I love, I love the things that are in this film. Yes. It's a little slow in spots. Um, you know what? It's a lot of fun and it's gory and goopy. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick with four eye traumas out of four, out of five. How about you, Mary Beth? I'm also going to give this four eye traumas out of five. Like Terry said, my first time watch. Absolutely incredible film. You know, has its, has its bumps, but, you know, cannot deny how incredibly impactful this has been on the horror genre and how it still stands up today. Paint and all. <laughs> it is disgusting. It is incredible to watch. Fulci is a master and it's just, it's damn good. So... That's all I got. <laughs> and then, Kevin, you have the final word. How many eye traumas out of five do you give zombie? I was also kind of debating between four or 4.5, but I think, yeah, I'll give it a 4.5 yeah. just because. Hell yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't really think of how it could have been done. I mean, how it could have been done better. I mean, there's, of course, some, like the actors, it's uh, it's you know, shot in different languages and, and stuff like that. But from just from a technical standpoint, I think it's it's still, it's really solid and uh 
yeah and it's like an iconic horror classic so and i'm just happy because the fulci is itself he had a quite tragic life and yeah. he was really depressed a lot and uh, so i think i think shortly before he died was the first time he kind of realized that he had a big impact on the horror world internationally but in general i think he was a very um, sad person unfortunately yeah so i'm just happy that his legacy lives on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah four point five. Yeah, have I? I'm curious. Have you seen any of the other sequels, Zombie Three or Four? Um, I'm kind of confused actually because I'm also confused because there's like Zombie Flesh Eaters, and I'm never sure if this is the one the, that he did with Bruno Mattei or if this is an alternate title for Zombie. I think and this, then, yeah, I think that's this one kind of is Zombie Flesh Eaters on Letterboxd. It mm-hmm. is this one is Zombie Flesh Eaters. Okay, I then think. I think it's Zombie <laughs> Four. Is the is the one he co-directed? I'm not sure which, if like it's like um, Le- um, Nightmare City. Is this also part of the zombie? I, that's why I kind of yeah, always get it, confused. It is, it is really hard kind of to like, keep them straight. <laughs> I think I have Zombie Three pulled up right now, and it was Lucio Fulci, and I think he was ill during the filming, and he had to to bow out, and so they also had Bruno Mattei. Um, oh yeah, this one I had seen. Okay, then, yeah. it, I think it has zombie birds in it. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yep. That, okay. So that's Zombie Three. I've not be? seen it. I own it on Blu-ray because, of course, I do. But I have not seen <laughs> it or Zombie Four yet. But uh, I, as I, after I finished watching this last night, I was like, oh, if it wasn't so late, I would just sit down and watch the next two. <laughs> <laughs> Are they entertaining? Is that one at least entertaining? It's uh, it's okay. It's not not as good though. You can kind of see the the moments that Fulci directed and mm. the, the ones uh, Matai did, and this this has some solid moments, but. Um, but in terms of yeah, films that are similar, like Burial Ground, as I mentioned, this is also like a favorite of mine. And and also like some newer movies, they're called um, The the Dead. Um, you might have seen them. There's like two movies of them, like The Dead 1 and The Dead 2. The Dead 2 is in India and the first one is in Africa, I think. They're from 2010, around 2010. Oh. And this is like the few modern horror films that kind of feel very much like the original Fuji Zombie. I haven't seen the second one, though. I, ju- I just saw the first one, which I actually quite liked. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, thank you again so much for joining us, Kevin, to talk about Zombie, because I am always happy to talk about this movie. I was really excited when you when you chose <laughs> this one. But where can our listeners find you and um, what do you have coming up that you can share a plug? They can find me on... Um, is there going to be a text or should I just say, like, on Twitter and... Mm-hmm. Uh, in Twitter, it's like Kevin Kopaka, just, uh, just one word. And Instagram, it's um, for those who still exist. And on Letterboxd, it's it's kind of the same. It's this FTWSE, um, which stands for for those who still exist, mm. which is kind of my moniker. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you feel free to add me and uh, stay up to date. And yeah, and Dawn Breaks Behind the Eyes is, as you mentioned, it's having its VOD and uh, theatrical release, actually, Ooh. like a limited theatrical release in the States on the 24th. So yeah, be sure to check it out. And yeah, I'm currently plotting the the next movie. Or I'm, I'm <laughs> in the pitching mode actually for the next film. And so I'm quite uh, happy to kind of give an end to Dawn Break set behind the eyes after four years and to kind of start the next project. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Because it was a, a long, long process. So, but thank you so much for having me as well. It was a blast. And as I said, I listened to a lot of your episodes and it was just really, really fun listening to you guys. So it's like, oh, I can't wait to to be a, a guest on the show. <laughs> we're so glad that you were here because obviously we were huge fans of the film. So everybody, please check it out. June 24th. It is going to blow your mind. Um, but listeners, you've heard from us. We want to hear from you. What was your experience with Zombie, Zombie 2, Zombie Flesh Eaters, however you call it? <laughs> um, <laughs> send us an email at scarredforlifepodcast at gmail.com or reach out to us directly on Twitter. I am at MB McAndrews. And I'm a Gaily Dreadful. And of course, don't forget to follow the podcast on Twitter at Scarred Podcast. And please don't forget to review, rate, and subscribe. Thank you to Eric Power for our artwork. Thank you to Sean Keller for our music. Thank you everyone for listening. Please stay safe out there, but most importantly, stay creepy. And until next time. <laughs>